going into order. This is the regular meeting of the Northfield Public School Board. Today is Monday, December 9th, 2019, and the time is 7 o'clock p.m. Dr. Hellman, there were just a couple of items in the table file. Yes, in uh, this evening's table file, we had two gift agreements, uh, some appointments, increase, decrease, change in assignments, uh, a few leaves of absences, and one resignation. Okay, thank you. Um, if there's no objection, we'll add these items to the agenda as we move forward. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Moved by Amy. Is there a second? Second by Jeff. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, we now have an opportunity for public comment. This is an opportunity for um, residents, business, and property owners, parents, students, and employees of the Northfield Public School District to address the board. Is there anyone here who wishes to address the board? No? Okay. Seeing no one come forward, we'll move on to announcements and recognition. Dr. Hillman. Yes, I have one uh, announcement this evening. Um, we're very excited to announce with you to you this evening that uh, tomorrow we have uh, what's called the Youth Data Summit. And this is for students from four districts, Waterville, Elysian, Morristown, Tri-City United, Faribault, and Northfield. And uh, this is part of the Achievement and Integration Program. This is an, uh, a day that we're bringing students from uh, each of those districts together for a special activity. And the purpose is to hear the voices of the students and to generate new ideas about how we might uh, improve addressing the achievement gap. And our Student Data Summit has attracted statewide attention. We know that there'll be some representatives from the Minnesota Department of Education, including the Director of Statewide Testing, Jennifer Dugan, uh, tomorrow uh, there. We had to turn people away. We had uh, representatives from several school districts who heard about this last week and asked if they could come and observe. And we've politely said, let us do the first one, and then maybe we'll think about asking you to come later. But we're certainly generating some attention in terms of people really interested in hearing youth voice around how we might be able to address the achievement gap. Uh, it will be held tomorrow from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the White Center on the Carleton College campus. Again, there are 80 youth, 20 from each district, who are going to meet together, get to know each other, examine district data, and then generate ideas on how to close the achievement gap. And we've got some pretty cool, what they're calling, yeah, swag. Um, and so you see that you got the fancy little uh, sticker here. We also have the wristband that says, I got data happy. Now that is right all of our, <laughs> it's the Yeah Data Summit. That, that one I really like, I got data happy, that's great. And then of course we have the t-shirt that says I'm helping close the gap. And the logo was uh, designed by a Northfield High School student, Michael Malka. And so we want to congratulate the students in advance for all of the great work that they're going to do tomorrow. It's important as students become um, older that they really again become critical thinkers and they think about authentic real world problems and we know we just saw another study that came out today uh, talking about that the Minneapolis St. Paul metro area is among the worst in the nation in terms of the achievement gap and so we know of no one better than to help us than asking our students for their ideas and ways that we can look to address that. So um, I want to thank Mary Grace Hansen and uh, Hope Langston and a number of uh, Malia Fallon uh, who've been really, um, Carrie Duba, really involved in getting this together and again going after elevating student voice. So well done and I know I'm supposed to return these items to Mary uh, at the end of the meeting so I'm not allowed to take them home. Plus I don't think the t-shirt would quite fit me. I might have to lose a more, few more pounds. So. Excellent. That's your announcement for this evening. Excellent. Um, anything, any other board members would like to add? So um, we can move on then, thank you, uh, to items for discussion and report. Uh, first on the agenda is our truth and taxation pr pr presentation for the payable 2020 property tax levy as well as the revised general fund budget. Just as a note, there was a um, updated slide in uh, the table file for the levy authorization um, page of the PowerPoint. So Val, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So we are going to walk through first the um, final certified levy. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. So the levy cycle, just as a reminder, um, each spring the county assessor assesses um, each parcel in the county um, and you get a statement with what your proposed property value, taxable market value will be for the next um, taxable year. 
Um, they calculate what's called net tax capacity, so you'll see me reference that a couple of times. Um, Minnesota's property tax calculations are pretty complex. So basically your taxable um, market value is divided by your class rate and it comes up with this net tax capacity. All of this, all of the amounts are set in statute, um, so they're required to go. The class rates are determined on the type of property it is and those sorts of things. And then the local tax rate, so um, all of the taxing jurisdictions, so the school district is considered a taxing jurisdiction, um, certifies a, an actual dollar amount. So you'll see a very specific dollar amount in my presentation tonight. That dollar amount is then spread across the net tax capacity. So regardless of whether or not we have billions of dollars of commercial or $50,000 of commercial, that dollar amount gets spread. So the greater our tax base, the less the burden is shared across. Um, we're in a fairly unique situation here um, where we have a pretty heavy residential um, and a pretty small commercial tax base. So our residents pick up a bigger share than some other communities in the state. So that's, so all of the taxing jurisdictions then certify their amounts um, to the county. We did that preliminary levy in September. Um, that's really the numbers that generated on the tax statements that were just issued. And this final certified levy is what will go on the final um, tax statements that get issued next year. Um, the Minnesota Department of Education sets the max levy limit for each school district based on multiple um, formulas and calculations. Um, it's extremely prescriptive based on what's voter approved and what's state authorized, um, but they all have very specific formulas that play into them. Um, and so then this is the process. So one thing that um, I feel is important to point out is in the state constitution, um, it is listed that the legislature is to establish a general and uniform system of public schools. What that results in um, is that school funding is highly regulated by the state, which, which we're aware of. Um, they set all of the formulas to determine our revenue. Um, most of the formulas are based on a per pupil calculation. They set the tax policy and the class rates like I discussed. Um, again, that maximum dollar amount. So if you recall in September, we certified at the max. That's the, the phrase that they use. And that basically means that we can't exceed that number today unless we had a voter authorized change, which we do not. So we are not exceeding that number. We could choose to under levy if that was something the district was interested in. Um, they authorize the $724 per pupil for the local optional revenue, um, and they limit how much you can do for an operator option. So it's extremely prescriptive um, because they are charged with that responsibility in the Constitution. <coughs> So just a reminder that a lot of these numbers are not, <laughs> not really under our control. Um, some of the things that can actually affect your property taxes um, are voter approved referendums, um, changes in enrollment for your school district taxes are pretty um, important because of the number of formulas that are driven off that particular count. So if we are increasing in enrollment, typically our levy is increasing as well. Um, and on the flip side, if we're decreasing enrollment, our, the amount of revenue we're generating is also decreasing. Uh, the state can also do levy adjustments for prior years, up to three years actually. So by the time we certify um, and put in our estimated pupil units, because we're always doing this basically a year, of, a year ahead of when we're going to actually get the revenue for our budget, um, everything's an estimate. And then after everything's finalized, they have three years basically to go and say, you really had 4,100 pupil units instead of 4,000, and they adjust all of those formulas to make sure that they're truing up the revenue that we're actually supposed to get, and that works both positively and negatively. Legislative changes, um, I will talk about one here in a, a few minutes that can really make a difference. 
to your, if you had a change in your market value, that very much drives the, um, the amount of taxes you assess based on how your property value changed in relation to the entire tax base. Changes in class rates. Um, so if your property changed from commercial to residential or um, things like that, that could have a significant impact. Um, or if we had um, properties that changed from a tax paying um, property to a tax exempt property, that would also impact the overall. And then obviously levies from all of the other taxing jurisdictions, so the city, the county, um, those are all the different things that go into what you actually end up seeing on your tax statement. So our specific levy um, is actually down about just shy of 40,000 um, or 0.2%. We're gonna call it flat basically. Um, because as you can see, the preliminary levy and the final certified levy are the exact same. Um, so we're certifying $19,985,995.93. So I was not joking about the specific number. Um, so that is the amount that we will send to Rice County um, and then they distribute that. We actually have um, land in three different counties. Rice County is our home county, so they kind of do all the distribution, but we also have property in Dakota and Goodhue County. So we collect taxes from three different counties um, at the end of the day. And the, the primary reason for the decline in our authority, um, and I'll talk a little bit more, but we are anticipating a slight decline in enrollment. And like I said, the vast majority of the formulas are driven by pupil unit. And so that um, really will run the numbers. So this is a comparison. This is the slide that was changed from your original packet that you received. I missed taking out the parentheses of that 205,000. It was not a negative, it was actually positive. Um, so you can see from pay 19 to pay 20, our levy authority went up about 205,000, um, but the actual levy certification from 19 to 20 went down 40,000. So. You can see in pay 19 between our September and our December, we had a $245,000 increase, and that was due to the bond referendum passing. And so there was some interest in things that got added to our debt service levy, which is what really increased that. Um, and so now that's all been consistent. So overall, we're, we're going to see a decrease of about 40000 so as a reminder, a lot of times when we talk about the levy, um, people assume it's our operating budget, um, but there are components for three different funds. Um, the, the bulk of it is for the general fund, about 14 million of the, just shy of 20 million is for the general fund, but 28% is for our debt service fund. Um, and as a reminder, we're required to levy 105% of our debt service payments and that goes basically into the debt service fund and then we make our debt payments. Um, that's pretty much all that happens in that fund. And all of those are um, voter approved um, bond obligations or ones that would have an offsetting revenue decrease in the general fund like our um, LTFM bond we did for the Bridgewater roof. Um, the general fund other is 29%. That's all the state authorized levies and miscellaneous formulas. So the local optional revenue, uh, operating capital, our LTFM is an aid levy mix. Um, the lease levy, our other post-employment benefit levy, all of those kind of miscellaneous pieces go into that. And you can see our voter approved referendum at 38% is the largest piece of our levy. The capital projects at 4% is also voter approved. Um, that is a specific $750,000 um, capital projects levy, and it's the same dollar. We, we actually under levy that one every single year because $750,000 is what we told the community, um, but it is based on a tax rate, so the dollar amount changes slightly, but we make sure it's seven fifty. dollars and then community services also has a few levies, um, and that's about 2% of the total. There's a lot of numbers on this page, um, so I'll walk through them. Um, 
The first section here is by fund. So the general fund you can see is 14 million. Um, it's up about 123,000 or 0.88%. That is due to a couple things. So the enrollment is projected to decline. So the actual operating referendum is showing a decline in revenue, but we added the achievement and integration program this spring. And so due to the timing of that, um, that is the program that is 70% funded by the state and 30% levy. But because we had already certified our levy for this fiscal year, the December before we found out this past spring that we qualified for the program, we're actually levying two years worth of the levy component of this program. Um, so we're getting two years worth, which I want to say was $100,000 total. Um, and there were a couple other formulas that, um, that increased, but overall, um, about 123,000. Community services is up slightly. Um, there's a handful of things that go into that. There's a early childhood family ed, and they changed that formula maybe three years ago um, to tie that to um, increase when the basic formula increases. So that had never been tied to any kind of increase before. So that one increases as our basic formula increases. Um, so that's the primary driver for that. Um, so they get about 417000 and that was about a 1.5% increase. And our debt service actually decreased 169000 or 3%. Um, the primary driver for that, all of our debt is basically the same. The payment schedules are very similar. But um, because we're required to levy 105% of our debt payments, what happens is that amount builds up in our debt service fund balance over time. And the state goes through a calculation on the levy certification to say, if you've gotten to a certain point, they basically reduce what your tax levy is to take that burden off the taxpayers because they've already been over contributing basically. Um, so that's what's happening there is we had enough fund balance that they are basically just giving some of it back because um, we have enough in our fund balance to cover our upcoming payments. So that's what the decline is there. And then the second section is by tax base. So this is the net tax capacity number I talked about at the beginning and referendum market value. So referendum market value is basically only used for the operating referendum calculation. Um, and net tax capacity is basically all the state authorized ones in a very summary format. <laughs> um, so you can see they're, um, they're pretty close actually. Um, so 10.4 million and 9.5. Um, the, the switch there is due to lots of different factors um, based on the property classifications. And then that bottom section is voter approved and other. So these are the three categories that we are required to show taxpayers the levy broken down into. Um, the state has a specific set of criteria that we're required to show. So the voter approved and other, um, this is gonna be a big conversation point I think for people this year, because it appears that our voter approved went down 8% and our other, which would be our state authorized, went up almost 18%. Um, that is really due to a legislative shift. So formula-wise, nothing really changed, um, but the legislature made a change. Um, the $424 that was the local optional revenue um, four years ago, they moved $424 off of the operating referendum and moved it to a state authorized levy to assist districts who struggle to pass a levy so they could at least get $424 per pupil. At that time, the legislature also authorized a $300 board approved levy. Um, we were already exceeding both of those amounts and so we it really didn't impact us. They have now moved the $300 into the local optional revenue. So effectively what happened is they just moved $300 out of our operating referendum into state authorized. Um, the dollar amount that we're getting is exactly the same, it's just in different buckets. So that's a little misleading in my opinion, but um, again, that is 
a prime example of how legislative changes can impact the numbers. And then this is just a little bit of the history. Um, so you can see kind of year over year where we've been. Um, outside of having any voter approved increases, we've really been flat. So minus 0 0.2, plus 0 0.2. This is the voter approved um, operating referendum increase. And this was the voter approved bond. And then this is this year going down 0.2. So overall fairly consistent um, across the board. So as part of the truth and tax taxation presentation, we are also required to talk about our budget um, and how that um, plays into the overall context. And we have historically taken the opportunity, since we're already going to talk about the budget, to just revise the general fund budget. The timing actually works out really well um, because we've got a whole bunch of things finalized that we did not have finalized in uh, May and June when I was um, presenting the adopted budgets. I'm just going to switch my notes here. This revised budget is um, quite a bit more detailed than what I usually provide, um, but there were a lot of moving pieces, and I felt like it was a little easier to follow <laughs> on paper than just me talking through them. So I will kind of go step by step, but the, the key things that we know now that um, we did not know in June and we are estimating in June, we now have our um, audited results, which they presented at the last board meeting. October 1 enrollment, as you know, is a key date for enrollment um, in Minnesota, and so we have that data that the state's going to use. Um, employment agreements are finalized. Um, all of the staff that we were projecting to hire have now been hired and we know where they were placed and how much they're making. If they elected benefits or if they didn't, all of those things play into the budget. Um, I did not include the Achievement and Integration Program in the adopted budget because we did not have state approval formally yet. Um, so that is an addition to this budget. Um, the lease purchase financing for the shop is also a piece um, that I'll talk to. Um, I talked a little bit about it with the audit where the expenditure happened last fiscal year, but the actual financing for it happened this year. So it's just an ad for that revenue that we got in. Um, that happened in July. We also sold our iPads and know how much that is. So that was an addition to this budget. Um, and our special ad revenue actually came in quite a bit higher um, for the audit than I had projected. So made some shifts for that, um, so increases for that, as well as um, some special ed transportation that I think will be driving some formula changes as well. So I'll talk through all of those, but that's a lot of things. <laughs> um, so enrollment is really, like I said, the big driver. This has been an interesting, um, puzzle for me to track for the last two years. So I like including last year because it's um, it was very telling for me. <laughs> so the adopted budget, we had projected 4,089 adjusted pupil units. Um, and when you weighed it, which is what the state formula is calculated on, it was about 4,500. When we got the October 1 enrollment, um, I scaled that back a little bit because it looked like we weren't growing as quickly as we had been the, the prior years. Um, and the enrollment calculations that we use are pretty heavily weighted um, towards more recent enrollment trends. So we went down to about 4,073 um, and our actual student was actually less than what I had projected. So. That is not the place that I prefer to be in. <laughs> I would much rather have a conservative estimate. Um, financially, everything actually worked out well, um, which we talked about with the audit, but it was less than what I was projecting. So for my adopted budget, you can see we had originally planned for 4,045 um, with a weighted of about 4,460, which is exactly what we <laughs> ended at last year. So I'm scaling that back a little bit more because the, the data that we've seen with the enrollment is that our elementary is slowing pretty significantly or declining. Um, and that our secondary is either stable or very slightly increasing. Um, so 
the new revised enrollment um, is showing 4,001.5 uh, adjusted pupil units and 4,415 weighted units. Again, there's a lot of things that play into this calculation. Um, and this, the, the 39 pre-K, um, as a reminder, this is a number that, that throws quite a few people off. We have, if you see the enrollment report, you know we have over 100 students um, in our early childhood programming that get counted on that enrollment report. But because they're not attending a full day, they don't get counted as one. Um, so all of those students um, get counted um, and about 39 is what I'm estimating. You can kind of see what we ended at 41 last year. Um, so that calculation is just a little bit different from what you see on the enrollment report to what actually generates revenue. Um, excuse me. And that is only our early childhood special ed that generate that. That has the pre-K, um, hand-in-hand preschool, all of those enrollment numbers are in the community services fund. It does not generate ADM. So the revenue revision, um, you can see is pretty significant. Um, it, it would always be my goal for it not to be quite this significant, but as you can see, there were a lot of things that went into play there. So um, the increase is about uh, 1.8 million. And the things that went into that, so the decline in enrollment that I'm projecting resulted in about $160,000 decrease in the state revenues. Um, you can see the state sources went up. <laughs> There are a lot of things included in that state sources. Um, it is all of our state formula. So it is not only the basic formula, it's our special ed formula, it's our portion of the achievement and integration, it's the aid portion of our LTFM. So there's a lot of things that go into that number. So special education um, was probably the most significant change. So I've always been fairly conservative with the revenue budget just because the formula is based on prior year expenditures and it's a six page formula that there's maybe two people in the state that understand. Um, so I'd much rather be conservative. It came in almost a million dollars more last year than I had anticipated in the budget, which is very significant. Part of that was um, a carryover from the prior year. Uh, we had got more revenue with some things that got finalized and part of it was just expenditure driven because as you know, we've had some, some significant increases in our special ed expenditures. The other thing that I'll talk about with our expenditure side is we have seen a pretty significant increase in our special education transportation expenditures. Um, that is actually reimbursed, fortunately, at about 99 to 100%, depending on how the state prorates that formula. And so that's all going to be additional revenue that's coming in. But again, we're kind of one year behind on the revenue. So I'm anticipating that to increase so that the revenue for special ed, I increased about 550,000 from my original budget. Um, and that is based on the last comprehensive aid report that the state ran. Um, and last year that, that actually came out pretty closely to where we landed. So. I think those reports are getting a little more accurate, which is good. The achievement and integration, um, that's a, overall about a $300,000 program. I'm still learning about this because it's brand new, um, but it is a calcul the amount that we're authorized for is a calculation based on the number of students we have and the, um, what's the term I'm looking for? the percentage or concentration of what they consider protected class students, so the, the students that this um, program is serving. That, because we're anticipating declining enrollment, the amount that we did our original budget on has actually declined slightly. So I'm not 100% sure how that's all gonna shake out. It's not really significant change, but it's, it's an amount that I just wanna make sure we're not overspending thinking we're getting a certain amount and we're not. So the revenue is about 300,000. I do believe, so the, the levy is complicated because the levy that we're certifying tonight is revenue for the next fiscal year. 
and there's two years worth of the achievement and integration revenue. I believe we'll be able to book back the amount that is meant for this year, um, but I'm not 100% sure about that just because of the way GASB works. And so I don't have the numbers quite lined up yet because I wanted to confirm with our auditors that we'd be able to book it back um, rather than do kind of a fund balance carryover thing. That's a lot of technical information, so I'm sorry, but I wanted to explain that because um, it doesn't make sense. Um, the lease purchase financing for the leasing property, so that was a $590,000 expenditure. Um, the financing when everything was said and done was about six hundred, dollars and so that was added as a one-time revenue addition for this fiscal year. Uh, the sale of the iPads was about 312000 again a one-time addition. And then our federal grants, um, we didn't get extra authorization, so to be clear, the $110,000 increase is really, we've had some carryover funds that we've been building that we're spending down. So we'll have some additional, um, the revenue for the federal program is basically what your expenditures are, they just match. So because we're anticipating more expenditures, the revenue goes up, if that makes sense. Um, it's not additional dollars, so. That's a lot of information. <laughs> so 56,972,099 is what I'm anticipating at the current time. On the expenditure side, a similar story, um, an increase of about 1.8 million, um, so similar increases on both sides. And again, you can see in the narrative there are a lot of things that, that are happening. I listed the largest impacts. There are several line items in the budget that got tweaked and changed that were minimal. Um, so I gave you really kind of the large brush strokes, if that makes sense. So the Achievement and Integration Program, again, like I said, I added 336000 because that was our original budget that we got approved. Um, I just want to make sure that the timing of the revenue makes sense. Um, this is not a budget that you can have a negative fund balance in. So I think everything will wash out, um, but I just want to dot my eyes and cross my keys on that one. Um, the increased salary budget um, is really based on an analysis of where we're at today versus where we've been at the last couple of years. Um, and with the addition of some of the staffing that we've included, excuse me. So that was about 397,000. Special Ed was about 250000 Again, um, there were some board approvals that happened um, as well as some analysis from the prior year. Um, benefits, again, the statutory benefits, if I'm increasing the salaries, those automatically increase. FICA is 7.65%. TRA is 7.92% this year. Um, and PAIR is 7.5%. So those automatically um, go with any salary increase. Um, we have had a pretty significant increase over the last two years, I would say, in our 403B participation, which is great for our staff. Um, so that was about a $47,000 increase when I looked at kind of where people were actually contributing um, compared to the budget I had included. And then the retirement HRA for licensed staff, um, that is an annual amount. Um, we sunset kind of our, um, in the teacher's agreement, their ability to um, stay on our health insurance for so many years due to the expense of that. And now we contribute $1,000 to a retirement HRA that's vested after 10 years. So that, um, because it was a sunset clause, there are more and more teachers that get included in that each year. So that one just kind of increases, um, but then it's a pay-as-you-go method versus the paying for 10 or 15 years or whatever it is of family health insurance, which is significantly more expensive. Um, so that is just kind of keeping pace with what we've seen as a trend for that. Um, purchase services is primarily just an increase for the transportation. And again, that was um, a large portion of that was the special ed transportation. Um, but there were um, in our regular category and one other category that I'm blanking on right off the top of my head. 
uh, were some minor increases as well um, based on where we ended the prior year. Um, supplies, we did increase the capital textbook budget, 36000 We had some um, AP biology textbooks, I want to say, that the, we had bought the electronic version and the license ex expired um, and they were needed and just had been on our, um, on our list for that year. So we added that because um, obviously we purchased those so they can have the textbook. Um, and then the capital, um, just to clarify, so the capital line here is not equivalent to the capital budget. Um, I just want to be clear. Capital and equipment is all of our, um, in UFARS, it's our 500 object code series. A significant portion is actual capital, um, but there are some, some co that are just coded to equipment that don't actually use capital funds, if that makes sense. So I just wanted to differentiate that. But that, we did buy a new driver's ed vehicle, um, which was 19000 So I added that, um, and then community services budget pays us back over four years. Uh, we do uh, um, journal entry to charge their budget and basically reimburse the buildings and grounds budget. And we've done that for a couple of years. It's worked well for them. So that's a lot of moving pieces. <laughs> like I said, that's a little more detail than I would typically go into, but because there were lots of things um, swinging different ways, I wanted to kind of documented on paper so you could see it. So this is the summary when you put all of it together. Um, and again, a lot of things happening on this page as well. So the 1819 audited results are what was presented at the last board meeting. The adopted budget, I left exactly as I presented. So you can see I was assuming we would start with $17.1 million. Um, but we ended a little bit less than that. So you can see for the revised, I've updated it with the actual. So if those columns are confusing, that's probably why. Um, so last June, we were anticipating uh, ending with about $10.2 million um, in unassigned fund balance or 18.3%. I'm now anticipating ending just over 10, so about a $200,000 difference. But you can see it's 17.48. That is primarily because these numbers are $2 million higher. So this is a calculation, this number divided by the 57. So if this number's increasing, it's decreasing that percentage, even if the number stays relatively the same, if that makes sense. Because um, that's how percentages work. So 17.48 is where I'm currently projecting us to end with our unassigned fund balance at the end of this fiscal year. Um, that is the closest we've been to 16% in my term here. And so we're obviously watching it very closely to make sure that we're confident in where, where we're gonna land um, and making some really strategic, um, we're looking at the financial forecast right now, which I'll present at the first meeting in January. And so we're really diving into what are some of the things that we can just tweak internally in the budget um, without having to actually look at a, a budget modification process to, to slow that process a little bit. But overall, um, I think talking about 17.48% and feeling concerned is a, a very <laughs> um, positive way to be. It, some people would probably laugh at that and say it's 6% when we get worried. Um, this really allows us to be proactive. Um, I think reactive budget cuts aren't good for anybody. Budget cuts are tough no matter what. And if we can be planful and proactive and monitoring the budget, it really just, I think, gives us a better um, strategy and approach to make sure that we're responsible to our employees and the taxpayers. So. That is a whole bunch of information, and I will gladly take any questions that you have um, about any of it. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, before I ask board members if there's questions or comments, <clears throat> because this is the Truth in Taxation public hearing, I'd yeah. like to ask first if there's any community members here who wish to address the board either with comments or questions. 
any community members here to address the board on truth and taxation. Okay. Seeing no one come forward then, I can open up questions or comments for board members. Ellen. So I had um, a question on the general fund budget piece. Yes. Um, I just more clarifying. Sure. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, the transportation purchase services that's the special ed transportation so the majority of the majority that of it is okay and then in terms of the then we have special ed increases so of the 250,000 some portion of that is reimbursable or yep um so that was mostly um salary staff increases okay um so the the state I would say reimburses their goal is between 55 and 60 cents on the dollar. Mm -hmm. um, so just slightly over half of that is reimbursable. And then the increased salary budget, so we know that we had um, agreements being settled and then presumably you know, we hire new staff and we, when you do an estimate, um, I'm thinking about this, you never know exactly where they'd be coming in in terms of steps and lanes. So some of it's that sort of piece. Is that? Yep. Some of it's um, staff just coming in higher. Um, mm -hmm. As as we've talked about, this is a destination district for a lot of teachers. Um, so we do usually get fairly qualified staff, which is great. Um, the other the other component to that is just looking at where our salary budget ended in the audit, um, and I would say particularly our um, educational assistant budget um, our I don't want to call it our buildings and grounds budget because there's a whole bunch of staff but it's kind of other staff both of those budgets were over last year we had spent more than I anticipated so I'm kind of catching up the budget also in addition to tying up the staff we've hired um, and the contract settlement so a few different things going into play there but um, we have seen a pretty significant increase with our educational assistant last year I suspect part of the other staff was really um, probably some overtime for snow removal <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so just anticipating that that may be a trend um, I'd rather have more budget available for that sort of thing rather than looking over budget every year does that make sense? Yep, that okay. makes a lot of sense. And I was just going to let you know that I really appreciate not only your summary, but the way that you laid some of the tables that you had in the presentation were very helpful. So Good. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Excellent questions. Um, other questions, comments? Amy. I just had a comment, yeah. and that's whenever you present to us, I'm always so impressed by your competence and your ability to um, display the information and in understandable fact fashion especially with all the numbers going on and I think you're very clear in your presentation and I want to thank you for that thank you great comment thanks Amy. other questions comments come are you one of the two people in the state who yeah. <laughs> I really wish I was it would make me feel so much more comfortable <laughs> and one of them is retiring this That's spring right. so we're all yep. of us, yes so you said that um, the numbers are average, are looked at over a period of three years on um, something? Um, yes, it depends on what I'm looking at. Um, a lot of times I look, so part of that is just our finance software. The, the max range I can run on one report is three years, so if I want more than three years, I have to download it into Excel and merge a bunch of stuff, so that's more information than you need. But Typically, I look at three years because that's the report access that I have the easiest. Um, the other thing I talked about is enrollment, um, and that's usually a little more heavily weighted on the more recent years. But we do have, um, the, the model runs like 17 different calculations, so there are some that are seven-year averages and six-year averages, but usually the ones that seem to ring a little more true for what we're anticipating are the three to four years. And, and the state looks at things over three years, and if the enrollment was higher or lower, you said sometimes it could be positive and negative, so these numbers could potentially change? Um, no, yes and no. <laughs> so the levy, um, the levy is an unusual thing because of the timing. So this property tax number here 
will not change because that is what we certified last December. So what we're certifying right now is, lev is revenue for next year's budget. So when I do the budget in the spring, this is my favorite number because I already know what it is. It's not going to change. The, it's, the whole levy is a five-year cycle, um, which seems a little crazy. But because we do everything a year in advance, and it takes MBE about a year, nine months to a year, to actually finalize our, uh, we don't get our final student counts until January at the earliest. So they're not even looking at truing up anything until basically two years after our levy, if that makes sense. Um, so that's why it's a five-year cycle. So it's, we do it a year in advance, we get the revenue, there's like a year gap uh, where they're kind of waiting for all the final information and then they have those three years basically to true up everything, if that makes sense. So for the most part, they're consistent about it. Um, but this number here does include both positive and negative adjustments. Um, I can certainly go into more detail in future levy presentations if that's something you're interested in. It used to swing really significantly, um, like to the tune of a million and a half or so. And um, since I've been here, I've been kind of tightening up our enrollment and making sure I understand that because I don't want to come present a million and a half swing in our levy. Um, I'd, I'd rather have it be a little more predictable. So I would say on average, we see 300 to 600,000 now. Um, depending on, it's usually positive um, because I'm conservative with our enrollment, but that's, again, it's, it depends on the formula. Is that probably more detail than you were no, looking for? No, it's excellent, thanks. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Great questions. Other questions, comments? Okay. Um, Val, absolutely. Fabulous presentation, really well well done. And I, again, I, as Amy and, and Ellen noted, I really appreciate the narrative because it walks us through all of the numbers. So okay. thank you. And You're I'm welcome. just always so fascinated to see just the swing that any few changes can make and how you have a handle on all of it. So thank you so much. You bet. Thank you. Okay. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. Okay. So we will move on now to... Um, the Northfield High School update, and here to present that is interim principal, Dr. Laura K. Allen. So welcome, Dr. Allen. Well, good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be here tonight. The purpose of this mid-year update to the school board is to report about progress towards Northfield High School Improvement Plan and to share activities and accomplishments and challenges right here at school. What is going well? I have five things listed up here, and I'm just going to go right through each of those. One thing, well, many things go well. Um, every single day at Northville High School. But let's talk about Raider Nation, which is four A's of academics, activities, athletics, and acceptance. The most important thing that I can tell you tonight is that our day-to-day -day classroom operations run smoothly. I've personally been in and out of classrooms in every department throughout the school, and you would be very pleased with the curriculum, the teaching, the student engagement throughout the building. When we talk about Raider Nation, we are not just referring to the triple A's, academics, activities, and athletics, that philosophy that most schools boast about, but we also focus on the area of acceptance. Acceptance is the fourth A that our Raider Nation concentrates on. Acceptance of all kinds of, of, all kinds of differences, that is, that we encounter in school and in life. Flex year two. Another thing that's going well. Just last week, in an effort to make some corrections and improvements with Flex, we took the opportunity to provide all of our students with a Flex expectations update during a CCR day, just last Tuesday. 
and we addressed five separate areas. First, we reviewed why did we start a FLEX program? You know, what were the goals of FLEX? We reviewed the general expectations about FLEX in our four largest areas here at school. You know, what do we expect in the cafeteria, the gym, the auditorium, and right here in the media center? Next, we reminded students how to find out information about FLEX um, by checking the FLEX grid on their iPad, by listening to the announcements, um, checking Schoology messages, and the mini posters right outside of our media center. The fourth thing we did is we told the students about our new FLEX offerings, such as the FLEX walking loop, the additional spike ball times, a very popular activity here, an American Sign Language Club, and our newly remodeled H-Wing Flex Room. So again, we told them about some new things here um, during, uh, during the Flex Hour. And most importantly, we thank the students because they help make Flex work. Now I'm gonna go on to, and this takes our third and our fourth and our fifth um, things that are going well. Let's talk about um, the site improvement goals that were presented to you here in August. The first one has to do with a college-ready theme. This year, a number of Northfield School individuals have been working hard to develop, develop and implement a plan for student choice on the ACT state testing date, and that's on February 25th, 2020. The ACT is not always the best choice for every 11th grader. Families received a postcard, and I gave each of you one of those postcards, that provided them with the information about the test options for this spring. Also, the students have been studying the testing options during CCR. The three tests that the students have to choose from are the ACT, and that's a test that a lot of us remember or know. It contains four multiple choice tests of English, math, reading, and science. It also has an additional writing component. The ACT measures skills that are acquired in high school that are deemed important for success in college. The AccuPlacer is another test, and that's one of their choices. It's used to determine how prepared a student is for introductory credit earning college courses. And this test is most often used to determine placement in community or in courses in a community college or a technical college. And the third test is the ASVAB, and that stands for the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. It's used to measure a student's strength for success in military training and is also used for career exploration. Our second site improvement goal that we presented had to do with parent satisfaction. As a staff, we have worked on communication with families and with parents. Administratively, we are sending frequent updates and in September, November, and December, teachers were asked to send parent emails highlighting a student's success in classrooms, activities, activities, and anywhere here around school. Also in terms of parent satisfaction, this year, Northfield High School changed the structure of our parent-teacher conferences. I believe you heard about this change in August as well. Um, historically, as we know, conferences existed so that parents could find out about how their students were performing in classes, academically and behaviorally, but technology has changed that focus. For years, the staff and parent community have discussed ways to make conferences more relevant. So it was decided that our first and our third quarter conferences would be focused on information gathering, and our second and fourth quarter conferences would be more traditional. On September 16th, very early on in the school year, we conducted conferences that gave our teachers an opportunity to learn more about their students from those students' parents. Parents were asked to consider five questions and to be ready to share answers. Those questions were questions like, what should we know about your student? What are your student's strengths? In what learning areas will your student need support? What really interests your students? And are there learning strategies that have been most effective or more effective and what were they so that teachers can best meet the students' needs? We had over 300 students represented by parents and the four-hour conference session just flew by. The most powerful communication I received, positive communication I received, was from a parent who thanked us for the new conference model and told me 
that this was the one and only time that the parent had ever felt comfortable at a set of school conferences. We also found that a similar number of parents came right back for our November conferences, and um, we think that that absolutely opens the line of communications with families and teachers. We're very eager for our third and fourth quarter conferences. Our final school improvement plan, that has to do with passing classes for NHS students and for students identified for intervention by the MTSS, which remember is the multi-tiered system of support. At the end of this quarter, just um, first week or so in November, 97% of NHS students had earned a passing grade in their classes. 70% of the MTSS students passed all of their classes. Our goal stated that 95% of our students would pass, and so we met that goal. Our second goal said 87% of our MTSS students will earn passing grades. Remember, I just said that that number was actually 70%. So the MTSS team is continuing to look at the data and strategies, and we expect to meet the goals by the end of this school year. What problems are we trying to solve? Flex logistics. While I said that FLEX is going very well, it is a program that requires intense supervision. FLEX is an all-out effort of many. Our administrative team at NHS, the custodians, child nutrition staff are on for a solid hour every day meeting the needs of our students. And our teachers are engaged in the effort each day and in CCR on Tuesdays. So every day there are things that we can improve upon. We continue to focus on FLEX. Rounding. Our administration met and rounded with 51 individuals at NHS. We determined two areas that we can concentrate on for continuous improvement. First, we will work to sustain our current practices in communication planning and decision making moving forward. And secondly, we want to bring an intense, or a sense that is, of transparency to the scheduling process so that staff members have a greater insight into the why behind decision making. Finally, in EL enrollment, remember English language, EL is English language, and um, we continue to look at our EL services at NHS as we have had an increase in our, in our enrollment in that area. This increase has prompted some critical thinking and important conversations. Our EL staffing has increased and we are grateful to you, the board, for your support of this increase. The team of EL teachers are adjusting their course offerings and will continue to assess the needs of their students now and in the future. We've had multiple meetings with the ALC discussing specific EL students and how to best meet their needs. We've had opportunities to work with our district's new diversity and cultural liaison. Our general education teachers would welcome additional training to better address the EL students in their classes, but in the meantime, our teaching staff has shown flexibility and patience as we work to best accommodate the students. Our EL staff is dedicated to their students. And then in summary, every single day when students and staff members walk into our school, they find exciting opportunities for social and academic interactions, exceptional teaching, and cooperative and collaborative learning. There are lasting relationships being formed and strengthened each day. For many students, their school day extends for hours after school while they are doing all kinds of things related to school. And that goes for our, our staff and teachers and coaches and advisors as well. A special thank you to the students at our school for all they do and for representing themselves positively at school and all around Northfield. NHS is a school that works and it works well. It continues to be an honor and a joy to be back here at Northfield High School. Thank you to the students and to the staff and to each of you as the leaders in this great district. And now, if you have any comments or any um, questions. Thank um, you, Dr. Allen. That was a great, great overview of what's happening of late at Northfield High School. So uh, questions, comments, board members. I'm sorry, Jeff, Jeff. 
Go Raiders. Thanks for, thanks for coming back. I, I hope you're having some fun and uh, reconnecting some of the old memories you have here and creating some new ones. Um, just kind of off, off the thing, what, what do you kind of notice from, uh, uh, as a positive change or different change from all the years you spent here to what's going on now? It could be any comment. Well, certainly there are many, many, I, I would say more opportunities than um, there were a few years ago. And, um, and students are, are, um, are taking advantage of those opportunities. Also, there is so much support for the academics um, of all kinds of students in this building. And man, I salute the people that, um, that provide those, those opportunities um, or those um, interventions so that students can be successful. Um, and there, there are some similarities. The other day I was in the orchestra room and it was just like I was back there with Paul Stoughton, and some of you will remember Paul Stoughton, and it was like, wow. Um, there, there are some similarities, but um, the whole building, of course, is much larger than it was when I was here. Thank you. It's a great place. Great question. Amy. I have two questions. Okay. Um, the first, I think, is really easy. Um, I was under the impression that the ACT was required of all seniors was and I thought it was a state requirement was that just a school requirement before and I think it's great that they're getting off the opportunity to take which one but I, I just was wondering if you could speak on I think I'm going to refer to my friend since I wasn't here at our school last year so the ACT at the state level has had an interesting pathway the last few years there was one year where it was required and paid for by the state then the legislature said, oh, we don't have the money to do that. So they basically offered the opportunity for students who qualified or for free and reduced lunch to have their tests paid for. Um, and I, I, I'm not even sure, actually, I have to think about it if this year that still is the case. So there was one year where all students and all juniors in the state were required to take the ECT. The state realized they did not have enough money to continue that, and the legislature no longer funded it. We have continued here to pay for students to take it. We get reimbursed for some of them, um, but we continue to pay for students to take the ACT because we look at it as a very viable way to measure our system as to whether students are college ready. Over the last couple of years, we've had some additional discussions about is the ACT the only exam that really can uh, share uh, how our students are ready for their post-secondary journey. Um, you see on this, um, postcard here a term that we believe we've coined called choice ready when students leave Northfield High School our goal is that they have the academic skills to be able to pursue whatever they would like to do that after high school whether that be a four-year school a two-year technical college the military some other kind of service or other kind of gap year and we want them to have the social emotional and decision-making skills to have the confidence to make that choice for themselves we've talked about that there's been some subtle pressure on students that the only way to be successful after Northfield High School is not just a four-year school, but a highly selective four-year school. We've heard, we've talked about that before. And so from when the ACT was required for all and then it was no longer required for all, we've looked at this three-tier model to have students show what they know in a way that best supports their post-high school plans. That's great. Mm -hmm. And then, um, thank you, Matt. My second question is about the fourth A acceptance I, I love your four a's um and i was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more on that and sort of what you know if there's bullying in the high school or what your sense of that is maybe you can compare it back to the old days i don't know but if you could just tell us about acceptance and how that plays out in the high school well um i was delighted when i i came here i was from um I spent 17 years at a school and, and it's triple A everywhere. And then when I came in here and saw the fourth A, I thought that's, that's very cool. It's referred to in many, many different organizations and sports and activities um, at school. Um, and it's sometimes just referred to when we're working one-on-one -on -one with, with students. Um, uh, if there's something difficult that has gone on and, and we're chatting with them, we'll talk about, you know, we need to, to have acceptance. We need to think about the differences of other and be respectful of those differences. So it's a teachable moment a lot of times and um, I can't really pinpoint much more than that except 
we use it all the time here, and I love that. Thank you. Ellen. So I was curious about the rounding piece, um, and if you could talk about, you have the communications and transparency and scheduling process, and knowing that um, you're going to be doing a transition um, with Principal Lear returning and you transitioning into a different position, and, and maybe this is more for Dr. Hillman, but I'm guessing the two of you have talked about the transition, and I'm particularly interested in, you know, like you, come up, you came up with these two areas of focus, so I'm guessing there'll be strategies, but that you'll have to hand them off a little bit, or, or maybe you'll be taking them on in different ways. Um, exactly. It's, it's very hard to know exactly how we're going to um, hit that because we do not have four members of our administration team together. But the scheduling process begins very early in a, in a school year. In fact, tomorrow we have a department chair meeting and we're going to review courses and we're going to be doing those kinds of things. And then the minute that the first of the year comes around, it's very fast. Um, moving and um, we will we, we will all sit down and talk about what we learned as we did these meetings in terms of the scheduling piece uh, and that one particular goal um, why do we place classes where we place them why do we um, why do we offer some classes with a small enrollment and some classes we don't I mean these are the very difficult decisions um, that a school uh, principal makes but with uh, a lot of input from different people. And I think uh, communicating why we're making this, the decisions we're making, uh, I think that's really important. Um, and not that we don't do it, but we will continue to do it and do it better. Um, and I don't have all of the, the logistics because I haven't seen um, uh, Mr. Lear for a little bit, but upon his return, um, we'll all be sitting down and we'll be working and um, and setting up really a good plan. Excellent. Other questions, comments? Huh. I know of at least one student who appreciates your coming to class and has noticed he would also appreciate you sticking around longer. But That's nice, thank you. Um, uh, I do like the new model for the, the conferences, and one of the comments I heard, and I have to share it, is the, um, the conferences where you go to the classrooms. People dislike that the most because, one, they get lost, and two, they're, they're waiting the longest to, you know, for, some, for a, a teacher when maybe right around the corner there's an opening for another teacher, and so they, they like it when it's all in one space and they can just pop quickly, especially when it's, you know, it all takes so long. And, and that's nobody's fault. I mean, no, it's, it's, uh, it's nobody's fault. And I know, I, I understand why they're doing it the way they're doing it. And, and that is um, because sometimes there are delicate conversations. And when you're so close, and we have a, a larger teaching staff, because sometimes when you have um, part-time teachers, that means for more bodies, uh, more tables, and all of those kinds of things. But they do do it um, every other conference um, session, is my best understanding. And um, I did hear exactly that, um, that it was really tough to choreograph one's night because you couldn't see the lines. And I also heard that some of the lines got very long in the back because teachers couldn't see, oh my gosh, there's five or six people. And we've talked about how you're probably going to need to walk the family out so you can take a little glance and um, judge accordingly and plan accordingly. But I do appreciate that feedback because that helps us do our job better. Other questions, comments? Okay. Well, I, I just, it was a great update, and, and clearly, you know, as interim, you're really continuing to move things forward and really um, doing some great work. Um, it was really interesting to hear the um, update on the parent teacher conference. And, you know, the, there's just been so many different attempts at, at um, various ways to to really engage parents and it sounds like that was a real win and when you had 300 parents um, I think that's significant and even more significant is you've engaged them and they're coming back I know. so I think that's a huge a huge hurdle that has been uh, um, uh, achieved because I know 
principal leader is here every year saying we're going to try something new with conferences and so I think it's it's really excellent so thank you and I think what's most exciting for us is to see someone with your wealth of experience and your background and and all of your knowledge to speak so highly of Northfield High School and to, to be here to make a mark for us on, on what's happening in, in the building is just really significant and we really appreciate it. Julie. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Hillman has a comment. <clears throat> so when I, um, when Dr. Allen and I spoke about this possibility last June or so, May or June, um, I was very excited for her to consider the position. I, her reputation preceded herself. I mean, she has an incredible reputation throughout the state, and I knew Laura K. Allen was good, and I have pretty high expectations coming in, and she has blown those expectations out of the water. The professionalism and the skill of this professional is beyond anything uh, that I have experienced in my career. I just told her the other day, I put her up there with one of my previous superintendents as two of the most professional people I've ever worked with in my career. We gave uh, Principal Lear a unique opportunity to work with his family and go on a St. Olaf global semester, an experience that will be great for him and for uh, him as he comes back. We could not have done it without having Dr. Allen step in. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Um, a true professional, great sense of urgency, getting things done. If you want to really get some steps in, try walking with Dr. Allen <laughs> because you're going to get a lot of steps in. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Well done, my friend. Thank you. As I, as I jokingly like to say, as I jokingly like to say, the only thing Dr. Allen has ever failed at is retirement. <laughs> <laughs> and we're glad she, she did. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Well, um, our next um, item for report, we welcome um, Director of Student Activities, Joel Olson here, to provide a recap of the fall 2019 activities and athletics. Welcome, Joel. Hello. Thank you for letting me come and speak to everybody. I do not have a slideshow like Dr. Allen did, and I apologize for that. Um, but some highlights for the, for the fall uh, season. Uh, we had um, 613 kids participate in, in our athletics and activities, uh, and that equates to about 48% of the kids, which we would love to have 100%, but uh, anytime we can, we can have close to 50% or more of our kids participating in something is really, really great. Uh, just having them connected to adults in our buildings and, and having a place where they belong and are valued, that's important to us. Um, you can look at the numbers. Uh, uh, for each of the uh, sports on top there and the activities on the bottom. Uh, good numbers, uh, football is down a little bit, uh, but, but you can see the numbers in the other sports where we have good, consistent uh, numbers from year to year and even growing in some of those sports. Um, some achievements and accomplishments. The girls swimming and diving team won the section uh, 1AA. They got moved up this year from 1A to 1AA and they won the section anyway, being in that larger class. Um, the volleyball team won the Big Nine for the third year in a row. And the bowling team, we just found out uh, over the weekend, placed seventh out of 70 teams in the state tournament. So that was pretty special. Um, and on the, the next page, uh, you can see the individual participants that were at the state meet for swimming and diving. And our, uh, our lone representative for cross country uh, also went at St. Olaf this fall, uh, Nicole uh, Terabarth, Tabarth. Um, What's especially important with all this success and the numbers of kids we have out is, is really we hang our hat on some things like academics. Uh, the, the silver award, which is a team GPA of 3.5 to 3.74, uh, girls tennis won that, or earned that. And the gold, gold winners of the 3.75 to 4.0 football, girls swim and dive and volleyball. So pretty exciting to have those students uh, take care of business on the competitive edge and in the classrooms as well. Uh, for those of you that went and saw the fall musical, Little Shop of Horrors, I'm sure you were impressed by the talented kids and uh, people that work with those kids. Uh, it was unbelievable. You would think you were watching a college performance or even a professional performance with the work that those kids did. Uh, then we celebrated uh, three athletes this fall uh, who signed national letters of intent. Drew Woodley uh, is going to go wrestle at Iowa State. Bronwyn Timperley is going to play volleyball in Northern Colorado. And Ella Kelm is going to dive at Mankato State. So we're excited for their journey and their next career uh, path. And then I think I was asked, um, what was our Dundas Dome time used from last year? And we had about 92 hours of, of time used. 
It was approximately 10 to 12 hours in the fall, and then the majority of the time in the spring. And we rent that from the beginning of seasons, like softball will start in the uh, beginning of March. And we try to keep that, as long as the weather's not very good, we try to use it up through the middle of April. So uh, if weather's good, we get out of there and, and get out under the, under the blue skies. So, so that was uh, the Dundas time for last fall, or last spring and fall. Um, other than that, that's, that's uh, the report from the fall. Excellent. Questions or comments? I had, oh, I'm sorry, Tom didn't go. Oh, okay. I had a um, couple of questions. So the 92 hours in the dome, that's been, I think that's around where we've always been. Do you anticipate that being, I mean, I know it's so weather driven, mm -hmm. but those amount of hours have seemed to, to be, um, working well yeah. in terms of getting everyone in yeah really what so the, the the baseball and softball are predominantly the ones that use that the most mm -hmm. and and as we get later into the spring um, the when lacrosse starts it would be nice to to be able to have them have some access so we give them a full week each when their season starts at the end of march so they can do tryouts and things in there so that so we know for that that week in march that they're really going to use that um, then it's dependent um, on, yeah, the weather, spring break comes into play for that. Uh, this year we're being a little more strategic in looking at, especially for softball, scheduling dome hours on game days early on in case there's weather related issues, we can play a softball game in the dome. So we don't have to reschedule that game. So, uh, and it's such a big and nice facility, we can share that space between different sports and activities that, that uh, don't necessarily uh, interrupt each other, so it's it's been a great, uh, great use for that. We we try to make the best use of the time, make sure we're going to use it, and make uh, the best use of the the money that's allocated for it. And if we don't have to use it, we get outside and, and get into the to the fields and stuff outside. Excellent. I mean, it's so great that we have that resource, but at the same time, you know, the hours are being yeah. judiciously. Yeah. So I think that's great. Um, and then my um, second question is if you would um, maybe talk briefly about the new coaches workshop that you conducted. Oh, gosh. Because that was a really great um, so ways ago. thanks to Northfield News, too, who highlighted it. But, um, yeah, I just thought it would be a great chance to provide an update. So part of the purpose of why we play, we just had a co uh, AD cohort today which was uh, a little tenuous getting to, but uh, we got there and there was a, a small number, but uh, we share some of the things that we're doing. And, and one of the things that I've always believed in is that when you have new coaches, um, how can we mentor them and guide them in that journey of purpose and education-based athletics? So hiring them is the first step and getting the right people is the first step. How do we continue to mentor them is the second. And so I offered up uh, to our uh, new coaches, and we had four of them, uh, this or five of them this this fall, and uh, I thought it'd be kind of a dull meeting with just me talking to them. So we invited Faribault, uh, Oatana, Cannon Falls, Randolph uh, to bring their assistant or their head coaches as well, and so we ended up having about 15 or so people come to that, and some ADs from the other schools came, and we had a uh, presentation on why we play and education-based athletics and what that means to be a uh, an a high school coach um, and and what is your purpose as a coach and then we took um, and we had three of our veteran coaches I'll call them come in and speak to about um, things that they have learned across, along the years and uh, just some of the pitfalls that they ran into things that they could help uh, new coaches avoid and so it became then the second part of that was question and answers and breaking off into groups and um, I thought it was valuable and um, got a lot of good feedback from our coaches and our head coaches that were there uh, as mentors. And it would be great to uh, see where that goes from uh, continuing that mentorship piece with uh, having those veteran coaches maybe partner up with our new coaches to kind of do a check-in uh, once in a while and, and uh, help them along answering questions because uh, they're, they're more in tune to what's going on with, with the sport. and. Uh, being able to help with that coach uh, answer questions that uh, is readily available for them. So, uh, no, it was great. We're going to plan to do it again next year, and we'll invite uh, more people and and uh, have more coaches be a part of it. I know we got coaches that do want to be mentors, 
So that's really neat to think that uh, we have coaches that do want to give back uh, and helping grow. So, uh, so yeah, it was really fun to, to do and had a good experience. Excellent. Yes, I think that's really great, um, you know, really setting them up for success out of the gate. So that's really excellent. So thank you for thank the you. update. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeff. Right. Thanks for coming in. Yeah. Uh, question, I think, if, if you had a magic wand, just to think about this kind of an open question for facilities or future facilities of what um, we have here on campus and kind of, you know, where are we falling short on... Uh, the needs of, and I know that uh, gym space is, is always a challenge and it's a matter of uh, within our design and again comparing ourselves to other um, districts our size, you know, what have they done to overcome that and what would be more of a futuristic plan to to uh, compensate for, for the spaces that we need so kids can get home and get their homework done and, and rest. We have uh, uh the philosophy. I'll start with philosophy. <clears throat> philosophy for me is, uh, it doesn't know it doesn't matter what the the facility is, um, whether you're in a in a facility with limited space or limited um, places for kids to go, or if you work or have a facility that has 14 gyms in it and 150 basketball hoops and things like that, it all comes down to the experience the kids have and as the, and the people working with those kids. So. First and foremost, we want to get people that are doing right by kids and, and providing a great experience for them. The facilities come in, in, into play when we can't um, provide the most that we want to. Um, you know, with our practices going until 6 o'clock or 6.30 and then the youth come in after that are going until 8.30 or 9 o'clock. Um, you know, we, we access every available space that we can with elementary schools and the middle school and the high school. Um, the, the youth associations do a great job of putting the, the kids in the right spaces. Um, the younger kids going into the elementary schools, the older kids coming over here to the middle school and the high school. Um, if, we could, if we could have a magic wand and, and do a grand plan, um, just from a facility side would be to uh, you know, have, a, have a space where we have a place where the community can be in, in there as well. So we would have a, you know, an indoor track you know, above the gym space so people can walk um, and use that during the winter. Uh, we'd have enough gym space where we could put all of our levels of, let's say for basketball, put all the levels in the same time right after school so they don't have to go early and late. Um, and then if we look at outside, you know, if we could bring the soccer teams back to campus and have enough fields for the soccer teams um, and then uh, look at the opportunities to you know if you, if you can go into like turfing up fields and things like that so you can have more opportunities for for uh, kids to, to go later into the day or later into the night um, or on the weekends and you're not uh, damaging the, the grass and things like that um, all of that looks uh, uh, would be would be a grand plan of, of uh, a lot of people having a vision of, of Seeing what the uh, not only the, the co-curricular experience, but what would be the educational experience for kids, and we want to make sure we're first and foremost thinking about that before putting sports first. And um, we would we would love to have the the opportunity to do so, um, but uh, we know that uh, we've got what we've got is great, and uh, we the the folks that are in there are doing doing well by kids. Uh, providing good experiences so um, I love I love this building um, I know there's probably some people that might not agree but to walk down the halls and to go into the gym and you got that that you can just feel the history and, and I love old buildings so um, so I I think we're doing we're doing great with what we got um, but I'm sure that there's a opportunity someday to maybe have some of those dreams come true so well, thank you. I've, I've run my share of sprints in that old gym myself, so thanks for your comments. Yeah. All right. And get Tom. Uh, and to sort of follow up on, on just on that conversation, um, you said um, that 48% of students, and you were hoping that more, is part of the reason that some kids can't because the practices are late at night 
because we don't have the facilities? No, well, well no, not necessarily. I think some of ours is our uh, kids are so involved with so many things, they make choices. And um, music, um, especially uh, here with kids in theater and music, they might have done things when they were in middle school, um, and as they get older and they kind of find their place, um, they just choose to do different things. Um, we could provide, um, you know, in the Big Nine, we, uh, the boys have four levels of basketball. The, some of the schools do in the conference do have four levels as well. We have three um, for numbers. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a work in progress with our youth association to providing these experiences for kids that, um, when I was coaching, I, was, I used to coach some middle school. My job was strictly to, to make it such a good experience that they want to come back next year. And, and if we can keep those kids out. Um, so I, I think um, there's some decisions and choices that families make. Maybe it's monetary, maybe it's um, when practices are. When we have some kids try out um, at the high school level in ninth grade, they don't realize the time commitment. And so they make choices regarding that. Um, yeah, so, so a variety of factors come in. But I think, um, for the most part, kids who want to try something, we give those opportunities for them. And there's always, if you walk in the hall, you'll see flyers up for new clubs and things that are being started. Teachers are doing a great job of, of taking interests of their own and providing those um, opportunities for kids to, to join their classrooms or join those things after school. So, so there's a lot of things that are really going uh, well with our staff that care about kids and, and want to see them be connected at school. And, I, and that's what we find is when, when kids are connected and they have caring adults that they, they do better and that they're, um, you know, just from a feeling a sense of, of pride and, and a sense of self-worth is, is so important with these kids as they're challenged in a lot of ways in their lives. So, um, so yeah, we, we keep, when somebody comes to ask about a club or an activity and uh, we talk it through and we say go for it and uh, we don't try to put any barriers upon them and things like that. But um, no, I, no, so I think I think we're doing a good job of uh, when there's a when there's a want, uh, we try to try to provide that for them. Yes. Um, you said that uh, football participation was down. Are people parents more concerned about injuries? Yep. Concussion, I think, is is more and more. Um, we uh, we have kids that. Football is fun to play, uh, but that's not their primary sport, and so they're they're saving their bodies for their primary sport, which is understandable. Uh, we this year, uh, this is our second year of using this concussion sensor system, and we had 30 helmets um, that were outfitted with this system, where uh, John Sand, our trainer and our coaches, um, can see kids when they get a hit, or what type of hit, or the um, severity of the hit and they can um, check in with that kid right away and say, uh, we see, you know, what was going on? Did you, did you have position wrong? Did you get in the wrong um, area? Did it hit the back of the head, the front head? So, so trying to tackle that problem from a preventative, me mess, uh, preventative way um, and then continually educating parents on um, the, the benefits of the sport versus the potential injuries of the sport. Um, but we're seeing you, that's where you might see soccer might grow a little bit, football go down a little bit, um, but uh, yeah, it's 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 a national issue with football. So. No. Thank you for your report. Yes, sir. It's clear there's a lot of components that go into a co-curricular successful program, but thank you for including also the the academic boards. That's important. Part of the component. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Amy. I also thank you for your report. Uh, last time you were here, we talked about um, somehow recording all this wonderful data that you're collecting so it'll be available for future mm -hmm. use. And I'm wondering if there's been any steps. Did we talk about digital, re like digital, like? Um, in the right, yeah, I believe you access. said they were on cards before yep. and, and moving it more into yes. digital. Yes, yeah. we um, actually we have a meeting tomorrow um, <laughs> looking at our registration systems uh, and what we use for registration for our activities. And um, these systems have a lot of what would I would say Cadillac 
uh, features to them when we don't use all of those features. And, and not to say that there's not good parts of them, but, but the, the cost benefit of cost versus what we use out of those programs um, in some cases doesn't work for what we need it for. So if we can refine and define what is it that we want to have for future you know, historical data, um, maybe these programs can help with that. Um, but what we do right now is, is uh, we do keep track with, uh, Cheryl has the coaches every season uh, do a paper copy of, of uh, all of the uh, records, all of the results, all of the awards and things like that, and we, we hang on to those and keep those. Um, so if, if nothing else, we could scan those into a, a PDF and, and hang on to them from a, from a standpoint in that way. Um, and I'll add one, I'll, I know we're going along here, but um, we have a, we, uh, Dr. Hillman and, and everybody was gracious enough to let me have a uh, activities website this year. And it's very, uh, it's been very useful and functional for us. And there's a lot of opportunities there uh, to add data and, and information for folks to refer back to. And we've got our Hall of Fame on there, uh, pictures from this fall and last fall. Uh, and as we gather more things we can put in there and teams have their own web pages that they can keep information up to date for parents and things like that. So that's another opportunity for us to, to have a digital kind of history of, of our program. So uh, that'll be, uh, that's a great conversation to have with uh, folks about how do we do that? And what's that look like? Um, is it simply a PDF or is it something we need to be a little more fancy with and a little more uh, uh, when people have, want to access it, that they could do that and just pull up things that are uh, by a search or something like that. So, um, so yeah, so if it, check out the website. If you got some feedback on that, just let me know. Um, love to uh, keep getting better with that, too. Something searchable would be, yeah, would be most right. usable. You're right. uh, then a question, mock trial is listed twice. Are there two different mock no, trials? Double, double, double entry. I'm okay. sorry about that. Just, thank you. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Well, thank you. We'll thank look forward you. to seeing you back for spring activities. Winter. No, I'm sorry, winter. Winter, winter. Yes, winter. Yes. winter. Thank you. Yes, and good luck this winter with thank uh, you. hopefully minimal reschedules for yes. council yes. games and all that good stuff. All right, thank you, Joel. Um, okay, so we'll move on. Um, we have here um, Sarah Pratt is here, uh, Assistant Director of Special Services. Um, to discuss um, an increase for a non-licensed special education assistant PCA at Greenville Park Elementary. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you all for the opportunity to be here tonight. I am here to ask for consideration of an additional 6.75 per day, 6.75 hours per day position um, of a non-licensed educational assistant, special education PCA at Greenville Park Elementary um, to meet additional student needs uh, as they've arisen throughout this school year. And the uh, information was included in your mm -hmm. packet. Oh, yeah. Sir, yeah. would you just talk about the process that you and uh, Cheryl did looking across the entire system to ensure that all the existing PCAs were being used uh, as close to their allocated hours as possible? Yes, absolutely. And we worked pretty closely with Val to review times clocking in, times clocking out to make sure all of the hours are consistent with the hours assigned. Um, the process that we follow when we get requests from staff and we have um, increased student needs is pretty extensive. We take a look at each individual building. We take a look at their staffing allocations, their staffing schedules, including licensed and non-licensed. We take a look at each individual student's IEP and we review services on that IEP, the amount of services required. Um, compare that to the student's schedule and the staff schedule to make sure that we are in compliance with meeting all of those needs. And we take a look at if there are any overlaps, if we are being the most efficient and effective with the staffing that we have possible, in, and still keeping in mind compliance with special education um, due process and with keeping students and staff safe. Uh, we look how we can reallocate, shift support, shift services, um, make sure we're not duplicating services uh, by having maybe two adults in one classroom for a couple of kids. Is that a way we can take a look and say, hey, you know, these two students, uh, we review their data, we say they've been doing well, they haven't required 
um, extensive adult intervention, we're going to reduce the number of adults in that classroom by one. We're going to reallocate that adult to this student over here. So we take a look at that across buildings, and then we determine um, if we have unmet student needs, and then come here to request the additional staffing. We also work with Val, sorry, we also work with Val to see if there are any unallocated hours or FTE in the district that we would be able to utilize prior to requesting additional. Okay, excellent, thank you. Questions, comments? Rob. Because I'm always interested in the um, maintenance of effort thing, mm -hmm. um, I see this says as determined by the IEP until the end of the year. So is this a position just for this year that we would only be approving for this, the rest yes. of the school year? Yep, traditionally and typically, um, if we hire based on unanticipated or unknown student needs partway through the year, um, we end that position at the end of the year and re reestablish a need um, when we do our student projections and staff projections in the spring. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Amy. I'm just wondering how urgent the need is. Is it immediate? Is it soon? Is it down the line? It's existing already, and it's a pretty significant safety need, um, and so it's fairly urgent. Okay. Other questions, comments? Uh, Sarah, we know, of course, um, well known, I think, and, and often not highlighted is really the shortage of special education, you know, um, not only teachers, but possibly support as well. Do you anticipate um, having an issue with hiring someone for this position? Um, you know, this year, I would say we have had excellent pools of staff and um, of candidates for opportunities that we've had throughout the year. and. Um, we always want to make sure we're finding a good quality fit and a good quality candidate. And I feel we have had great luck this year. I was just looking at uh, a couple of candidate pools for existing positions that we'll be interviewing for um, in the near future and feel pretty confident that we have a decent pool of candidates at this time. Excellent. Thank you. Any final? Yes, Amy. Uh, it, since this is an urgent need, I would like to suggest that instead of, since we only have one meeting this month, if we can actually move this, um, the vote on this position up to today, so they sure. can use it. So you don't have to wait until January. So. Sure. Um, so if we can have a motion then to move this to an item for individual action. Move to uh, so item. moved. Is there a second? Second by Tom. Any questions, comments on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We'll move that to an item for individual action. Thank you. Excellent. Well, and um, you and I just spoke briefly before yes. before the meeting. Um, you know, typically um, uh, Cheryl Hall is here, but it's just wonderful that you were here as the assistant director. We don't get to often interface with you, but I know what an excellent job you do to not only support Cheryl, but all of our students and their families. And so it's just a great opportunity to say thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks. I'm lucky excellent. to be here. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we will move that then to um, I'll keep that there so we know what we're moving in terms of dollars. So um, our last item then for discussion is the policy committee recommendations. Dr. Hillman, we're looking at a number of different policies. Again, um, this is first reading, so we would take action on these at our next board meeting. So a good opportunity now for um, Dr. Hillman as he presents the overview and then us to ask specific questions about um, some of the policy um, in case, uh, or in some cases, additions, and in some cases, new policies. Dr. Hillman. Yes, and so in the first reading items this evening, most of the policy changes here are recommended by the Minnesota School Boards Association based upon legislative changes in the 2019 session. So if you remember, we asked you to adopt that approach where if it was simply just a, a reference change, that the administration could do that without your approval. However, there's also a whole slew of policies, frankly, that when the legislator let when the legislature made changes to laws, that those needed to be incorporated into the policy. So most of the policies that you're reading here uh, are directly a result of legislative changes that the school boards association is recommending for change in policy. There are a couple of items I do want to point out that are exceptions. Uh, one of which would be in terms of. Uh, policy number, just scrolling to it here, 
534. So this is not a new procedure, but we're shifting the unpaid meal charges from procedure or from procedure into policy. So we know that we for many, many years have had what I consider to be a very humane approach to unpaid meal charges. We do not have a history of you know, taking student meals or things like that if they are uh, behind in their payments. But we know that with some high profile cases across the nation that our, pol our procedures were within the child nutrition department handbook, it's not really a handbook, on their website for lack of a better term. We felt it was important to move into policy, so we routinely get questions on this actually. And so being able to point to a specific policy, this is not new, uh, this is basically taking what we had in procedure and putting it into policy. And uh, we have been asked for our procedures by several advocacy networks, and our procedures have always been highlighted as a way to handle unpaid meal charges in a way that does not impact the student, yet make sure that it holds the payor accountable. Uh, another part that you will see here, which is new, uh, is a service animal in schools uh, policy. This is a relatively new phenomenon in terms of where uh, students may, we don't have any students who formally have a service animal in school. There's a very specific definition of what a service animal is. This is different than say, uh, we do have some um, dogs that do come in for uh, students to interact with and uh, to be able to de-stress and things like this. This is a different approach. Um, we had actually looked at a number of school districts who already had policies. The School Boards Association until about a month ago did not have a model policy around service animals. We spent one of our policy committee meetings creating partially our own and then the School Boards Association came out with a model policy. So we always <laughs> choose to use the model policy from MSBA when we can uh, because of the fact that we know that their legal team has looked at it and then we don't have to pay our legal team to look at it. So, um, those are just a few of the highlights of the items that are coming forward. Uh, so thank you for our policy committee. I see, of course, that we have Noel and uh, Ellen and um, Rob who are part of that policy committee, Jack Rizzo, who is, uh, and Simon McDonald, that are the student representatives. They are here tonight. They have had the joyful opportunity um, to be able to go through these policy revisions. And it is, it is the governance of the school district, right? So it is important. Sometimes it can get a little dry until you need it. So first reading, and I just want to thank our policy committee. We have some tough sledding ahead. We have a lot of policies to review because there were a number of legislative changes this year, and in addition to our four-year cycle. Excellent. Questions, comments? Huh. Oh, okay. Well, maybe. mine's just a comment, in which is thank you for putting in the part of the policy that says it's the parent's responsibility to monitor the iPad use. Because I remember when my daughter was going through school, it was like, this is my iPad, you can't do anything with it. But it's official now if it's in the policy. <laughs> Thank you. Tom? Funny you should say that, because I'm just the opposite uh, uh, take on that. But uh, um, actually, I have a couple. Point, uh, things? Sure. Okay. Um, first, in my packet, at least, there's a 524.2 that looks like it's pages one and four. Yeah, and then, and then there's yeah. another one that has. Yeah, yeah, that so was that's just. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we caught that. Okay. Um, and uh, again, in uh, 524.2 and section three. Oh, hang on, let's get there. 520. Okay, section three. Go, yeah, use go, the technology. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, if a student uses their own resources outside of the school for activity provided, uh, prohibited with school resources, is there ever a time when the school can access the student's private um, uh, resources or be involved with outside activity? So, if, perhaps so I'm going to say it depends because one of the things that we would look at is there a nexus you know, to the school situation? Is there a nexus to school? Um, the second part is the case law in this area is evolving as we speak. Uh, it, is a, it is a piece where the key thing would be that um, under my current understanding based on this evolving case law is that um, there would need to be permission you know, for the school district to access the personal device uh, there was a, there's been a couple of cases uh, where 
there had been access to the personal device and there was a question of whether or not that was voluntary access. So the, this case law right now is unfolding before our eyes because we are at a point in history with the technology where it is, um, the question is if it's accessing the school network, does that mean that uh, we are, that that, per, that person is using a school resource? So again, what you've seen in the policy update here, Tom, is reflecting some of the legislative changes that have happened attempting to respond to this. So I wish I could say yes or no every time, but I would say that there are a number of different factors. In general, what I would suggest is that there would need to be, at this point, there would need to be permission, you know, to be able to access willful permission. Um, but again, this is unfolding before I, I think we're going to see some ebbs and flows with this approach outside of policy, but more so in case law. Okay. Um, and, and, whoops, sorry, 1J. Um, Wait. Same, 524. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, district owned. Um, Non-district owned equipment can be used to access school or district data networks and file. Oh, sorry. So um, I was going to ask whether smartphones can use the, the Wi-Fi, but that's the, would that be considered the data network? Yes, it would. So um, no non-district owned equipment, so smartphones cannot use Wi-Fi at the school. Could you share with me which number, which letter? That's one J. Yes. So there are two pieces there. We provide two different networks within the school. We provide a password protected network mm -hmm. uh, that all of our school owned devices are automatically coded to access. We also offer a guest network for that. The um, your phone, my phone, whatever, are able to access the guest network because it is specific for non-school district owned devices. It, it would not be appropriate for um, a student to access with their personal device the password protected network. Right. So there is a difference and in this case that particular part is talking about the password protected network and file servers. All right, you know, um, is the guest network ever mentioned? in any policy? It is not because that, when we try to write that policy, we try to write it globally right now. The guest network is how we access it a year from now or two years from now. There could be something a little bit different. So we do not reference the, the, the password protected or guest network because when we look at this particular piece, we're specifically talking about um, accessing those things that are password protected by the district. I understand what you're saying. We'll take a look at it to see if we can clean that up a little bit. This is an example of where this is the latest revision from MSBA, and it does not include that. Right. And every school district has a guest network, yeah. right? So okay. yeah, no. it's, I think it's one of those yeah. parts where we are still trying to catch up in policy with what the practice is. But I appreciate the feedback. We will take a look at it and see if there's a way that we can um, carefully delineate that. We'll use our students to help us with that part as well. Um, all right, if I can keep going. Jeff, did you have a comment specifically about the guest, guest access? Yeah, well, so the guest network would be, uh, it would be, I guess it depends on your definition of security. So the guest network is a public network, and just like any other public network, I would always advise caution, you know, in terms of utilizing a guest network. Uh, we don't have a ton of specialized security precautions on the guest network like we do on the password protected network, but there's a clear delineation between the two. So getting on our guest network is probably no different than getting on McDonald's, you know, Wi-Fi uh, network. It's intended to provide what does protect it. It does not allow you to use things like district printers. It does not allow you to access district file servers. So if I am on the guest network and I tried, we don't even use file servers like that anymore for kids in the old days. It wouldn't let you connect, you know, to the file server. There's also another layer of um, filtering protection on the guest network. So there are certain sites on the guest network that from time to time we get complaints from families saying, well, how come I can't use Instagram on your you know, public network? Well, that's part of the item that is prohibited for a number of reasons, including bandwidth, so that when we have a lot of people in one place, we don't have a bunch of people uploading photos and slowing the network down. For others, we're not providing a Cadillac guest network 
uh, but we are providing reasonable access. And so those would be just some of the differences between the guest network and the password protected network. What does the guest network cover? What areas? Is it pretty much in the school? Oh, um, yes, very much so. It's um, there are. This is an interesting building. So there are various spots within the building where there are some issues, um, but for the most part, the guest network does cover almost all buildings. We have a desire to see if we can get it at the football field, but we're not there quite yet. Yeah. Tom, you have other questions? Um, yeah. So, to, to Amy's point. Um, in part four of the 240, or the place we were just at, where it, uh, it talks about parents' responsibility. So 524.2? Yeah. And then sorry. what spot, are you, what point are you at? Number on? four. Number four, parents' okay. responsibility. Okay. Um, well, I, you know, I appreciate the, the, the intent. I don't know that it's the school's uh, place to tell parents how they should, what they should do regarding uh, internet use at home. Other than um, <coughs> the second uh, sentence in that uh, part where parents are responsible for monitoring um, students use on school district or school related equipment. Um, I wonder if uh, that could be rewarded perhaps. So I think that you hit on it, Tom, and the fact that the intent of that new MSBA recommended section um, is to make it very clear that, you know, when a student device is outside of the school district, um, that it is not something that the school district can continue to completely supervise the right. entire time. So if you, I think the really the controlling part goes back to the top and purpose talking about access to school district technology resources and in the advent of allowing student devices to go home, um, which we have always had this kind of approach when we've talked with families about um, our school district devices going home. This is the MSBA policy putting that into practice. And it really is, I almost consider it more of a, um, a good faith notification, right? And the fact that because it's a school district issued device does not mean that everywhere you go do the school district's protocols, security protocols go into play. And so we've tried a number of different things over the years with that here. This is the um, MSBA recommended addition to the policy, really essentially ensuring that parents know that just because it's a school issue device does not mean that when they're at home that they are necessarily under the same exact security protocols, same uh, web access limitations as they might be here at school. So I, I think the intent of that, Tom, we could certainly try to take a look at how we might modify that a bit. Um, I would want to talk with the MSBA folks because that, that was a specific addition that they made that we would want to ensure that we are in alignment with what their legal team says. Yeah, no, I, I certainly understand that, but um, the, that first sentence where it talks about um, things like television, telephones, radio, movies, and um, other media, um, that is not school related. To have that part True. included in there seems like a little bit of a big brother or some or something. And yeah, and I think their intent there, as I look at it, is to really um, try to help people understand that this is another source. No, to give some examples. Right. Yeah. No. I'm, right. But what we can certainly take a look at. I would just. I, what I really want to do is make sure that we talk to the school boards association about the rash because this was very intentional language of how right. they suggested it. And the one piece that I need to just to double check is that. That may be because there were so many changes this year made based upon legislation. And part, this is a unique one because this is not just about state statute. This policy also puts us in compliance with uh, the Children's Online Privacy Act, COPA, um, which is required for us to be able to in alignment with in order to gain access to E-rate funds, which gives us some reduction on some of our internet service and allows us to purchase some network uh, equipment at a reduced cost through a federal government program. So unlike a number of the others that we were talking about, this one is more than just the state legislature. This could also be an update to the Children's Internet Protection Act. All right. well, we will check. Okay. You've asked so the question and we will check on it. Uh, and then uh, if we could go to um, 532, use of peace officers, uh, yep. teams. 
Um, it talks about removing students, uh, IEP students, from school grounds, and it doesn't say, I mean, my impression is that you take the kids, you put them out on the street, and they're on their own. And, I mean, they're vulnerable to begin with, and they're, it's, uh, it, it's not like spelled out what happens to them when you remove them to, from the grounds, and then can they just walk back in, or uh, it, there's, it talks about in um, uh, a deep parental notification where there, you, need, you can make a reasonable effort to contact the parent, but I can't imagine you're going to take a, a kid and just take them off school grounds and, and leave them there, uh, but yet the, the policy seems vague on what becomes them and who's responsible or... Uh... Tom, could you share the part where you initially shared, talked about, about the leaving school grounds, the section part where you're talking about that? Um, Yeah. B, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Four B. Okay. Yep. Four B. Yep. So, Tom, I think that um, in my review of this again, this is Minnesota School Boards Association recommended language, and this has not changed. There's only one change in this policy, which has to do with the reporting components. Right. They're requiring that we report differently. That was a change in the legislative. So in this case, I would argue that it is inherent that we would not take a student off school grounds and leave them there. I think that we're talking about if they were removed from school grounds for the purposes of attending a possibly going to a hospital or potentially could be a law enforcement uh, situation. So I, I understand what you're saying. I don't think that, I, I think this is where I use the reasonable person, you know, theory that the reasonable person, you know, would say that of course we're not going to take a student and leave them somewhere three blocks off of campus. That wouldn't be the way it would work. There are very specific protocols um, that our special education team goes through in terms of making sure that students are in the right place, number one, for their own safety okay. and for the safety of others around them. So I, I would argue that it's inherent in the policy that we have, a, we have a responsibility to take care of that student, whether that student can still be on school grounds or not. And this is a, in a very unique set of circumstances that frankly here happens very infrequently. If that was the case, then we would, of course, either send someone, one of our staff members with them, um, and it's not just about reasonable efforts to contact. We have very good ways to contact the parents. It's rare that we're not able to contact a parent, and most parents have given us additional people to contact should there be an issue. So I appreciate what you're saying. I, I, I don't personally have a concern with it, but I, it's something we can certainly ask the question if it's concerning to you. Um, well, it's um, uh, because you, you do talk about parental notification as a specific thing, at, sort of like after it's happened. And since these are policies, or sure, we have these things in place, or we think we do, or what, whatever, and you know, we're good people, we would do this. But um, if it has any kind of consequences or whatever, do these need to actually be spelled out so that you don't just take the kid, or, or you know, we think, oh, somebody's come to get them, or, or they took them. Uh, somewhere, um, I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that's too much, or uh, maybe just follow up on it. So we can ask that question, Tom, because this is you know this is the policy language has been recommended for some time and right. has been vetted and reviewed by their legal team. But it, it's a fair question to make sure that something is spelled out appropriately. We can certainly ask the question when we bring it back for the next time we can give additional feedback. Okay, great, thanks. And then I think um, just one more, um, maybe two. Sorry for all No, these. that's fine. That's, that's, that's the purpose why we're of here. the first reading. That's why we're here. In 534 unpaid meal yep. charges on 4B, uh, the school district may post the policy on the district's website. Uh, is that may and that um, it's allowed or it's not allowed or it's optional or should that be we sh shall post it? I know it's a 
kind of a nitpicky thing, but um, we we do post it. So okay, then yeah, maybe yeah. Shall. shall or something. <clears throat> yep, we can make that change. And then finally. Um, <clears throat> Policy 603, curriculum development. Um, thank you for, for everybody who did it, but the uh, discussion about dyslexia and the procedures for screening on that. Can you tell um, me the number, Tom? Uh, that number, F. F, got it, yep. yep. And then, um, G, I guess I'm not sure what that means, that, uh, that school is free and we need to tell people that school is free up until the age of 21? Yes, yeah, so there are some students who in certain circumstances qualify for um, time in our school beyond what would be considered the traditional exit from the school. So in this case, there's a number of students, for example, at our area learning center, you know, who um, go beyond the age of 18. And this is, uh, this is underlined, so this is new language from uh, the Minnesota legislature requiring that people know uh, that they have the opportunity to continue on, that it's intended to, to avoid dropout, which um, we already do that, obviously, because we have a very successful area learning center program. Again, when we're looking at some of these policy changes, we may have had a local practice, which in this case we do, that has existed for some time. Uh, where we are simply codifying it and putting it into the policy language based upon the lit because apparently some places they have not told them that they are eligible to stay. All right. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Comments? I love it. That's great. Yeah, no, Good this is questions. Great. Anyone else? Okay. I do have a couple, so I'll be brief. But um, 510, the first policy school activities, um, it's um, discussing an annual evaluation of school activity programs presenting to the school board. What, how extensive is that? What is that going to entail? Um, looks like they're asking for an annual evaluation of school activity programs, which as we know in our district are quite a few. Um, what type of effort would that be? And um, who? Which who, number are you talking um, about? I'm sorry, policy 510 yep, got E. E. Yes. So I would I'm assuming argue assuming that's new because it's underlined. It is. Okay. And so what I would argue is that we are conducting an annual evaluation. I think you're also getting that three times a year, right? From but Director okay. of Activities Joel, Joel Olson okay. just shared. So okay. I would say that when you look at that approach, that is the minimal piece, but you're really getting three different evaluations from Mr. Olson each year after each season. Sure. Okay. I just wondered how it is extensive of a reporting and review they were actually asking for so it doesn't obviously we're already doing it so that's good I was hoping it wasn't some onerous effort that we now had to um, undergo um, my other question um, on the policy 535 service animals yes in schools so um, yeah I, I can see how this is um, um, something that was um, needed to be written in, and thanks to the, the committee and MSBA um, for their work on it. Under liability, um, it's owner of a service animal responsible for any harm or injury. Um, would there um, not be that same situation for a non-service animal? So if I'm a non-service yeah. animal were to cause any harm or injury to an individual property damage. So I guess my question is um, wondering why they would not have also mentioned non-service animals under liability. Yeah, great question. So the re okay. I, I believe, Julie, the reason that, that this is setting, so if I am a person who uses a service animal to assist me um, as an accommodation for a disability that mm -hmm. I have. There are some very specific, there's some very specific parameters. In fact, there's an application that has to happen mm -hmm. because you aren't able just to say, um, I need a service animal to help me through X, right. Y, and Z. Right. You have to provide some documentation. There's an application that you have to fill out. And so th those service animals can be with a person the entirety that they're at school. 
So it requires a little bit of a different set of mm -hmm. circumstances. And they're talking specifically in this case, they're putting a box around service animals. Mm -hmm. So it is the policy specifically addressing service animals, not addressing non-service animals. So that's why they're not putting that in this policy. Well, the only reason I ask is because the previous paragraph discusses non-service animals, or there's two. They discuss non-service animals for students and employees. So they are addressing non-service animals within the policy. So that's why I was just interested as to why under the liability piece, they didn't reference non-service yeah, animals. That's a good question. We'll find that out. Okay. Okay. This one is new. Yeah, no, and, I know uh, it's new. And so that's why I was um, just curious. Um, and we, we actually have had a lot of debate on this one, really examining. Well, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to again, you know, really take care of all the, the different aspects of, of that, you know, a, a service center or a non-service animal in, in the building. So, so yes, that's thank you for, question. you know, that's, that's a good piece and we'll make okay. sure that we check okay. in on that. Great. So any other questions are on policy? All right, so as, if board members, um, again, we um, thank you to Dr. Hillman and Anita who will be back in touch with MSBA to clarify some of those questions. And if board members are reviewing it um, prior to, actually our next board meeting will be in January. Um, so um, we would take action on these policies at that time. And again, thanks to the policy committee because this is a, this is a, a, a really important effort, but it's there's a heavy lift to, to being on the policy committee, so we appreciate the people who are serving on that. And especially as we get the cycle rolling, right? And as right. we start to you, the, every four years, we will, it's important we have these questions now, because this is the, some of the most important work of the board, the governance work, to make sure that we're asking, because these are this is your directive to us of how to handle these circumstances. So we, we not only welcome the questions, we, uh, urge you to share them with us because we want to make sure we get it right. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, that does um, uh, conclude our items for discussion and report. So we can now move on to the consent agenda. Um, there were just a couple of uh, personnel items in the table file that were added to the consent agenda, um, as well as a gift, some gift agreements. Is there anything anyone would like to pull from consent grouping? Is there a motion to approve the consent to be moved by Ellen? Is there a second? Second by Amy. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we will move on now to items for individual action, and we have um, a few, um, as well as the addition of the um, special ed PCA. So we will work through those. Um, the first item for individual action is the certified uh, final 2019 payable 2020 tax levy. So is there a motion to certify the county auditors the 2019 payable 2020 final certified levy limitation and certification report in the amount of $19,985,995.19? A figure that we know Val has memorized. Is there a motion? Uh, moved by Noel. Is there a second? Second by Amy. Questions, comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, along that slide, same line then, we will move to the general revised general fund budget. So is there a motion to approve the revised 2019-20 general fund budget of revenues of $56,972,000 and $972,099 and expenditures of $57,580,443. Is there a motion to approve the revised? Okay, moved by Ellen. Is there a second? Second by Amy. Any questions or comments? Okay, we have a motion to approve the revised general fund budget. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, we now will move on to approval of policies 300 series. As you recall, we had the first re re reading at our last meeting. So is there a motion to approve the changes to the 300 series policies as presented? Moved by Tom. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ron. Again, questions or comments? 
All those in favor of approving the 300 series policies, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We have the additional items for item for individual action. So is there a motion to add an assistant PCA at Greenvale Park Elementary at a cost not to exceed uh, for the balance of the 2019-20 school year, not to exceed uh, $17,155. Moved by Amy, is there a second? Second by Tom. Uh, questions, comments? All, right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. So that does take care of our items for information. We can move on, on now to Items for information, we have construction update number 18, Dr. Hillman. Yes, yeah, so you'll see that uh, we have had some exciting items here. And as I talk, uh, Mr. Dibbick is going to go to the computer because we've got some pretty cool video footage from the latest drone flyover <laughs> to show you. Uh, so a really big week at Greenville Park, the new Greenville Park mm -hmm. School last week. If you noticed, the precast concrete panels were erected. We, it actually looks like a building. The gym is there. The steel uh, studs are going up. You really see a lot of progress in a very short amount of time. Now, that gymnasium piece is really important because not only do you start to see the building, but it is also now allowing, it will very soon, once the roofing is complete, will be allowing the uh, contractors to store equipment inside, which is really important mm -hmm. for the winter build. So these are literally, we just got these flyovers this afternoon, I think they were from last week, Josh Cooper from Knutson provided them. So Mr. Dibbick, would you go ahead and queue up? And I know we're not, we're not gonna get to focus the camera over there, Bruce, and that's okay for right now. So go ahead and... Can head it in. <laughs> Spectacular stuff. <laughs> I feel like there should be some dramatic music. I know. <laughs> yeah, this is we didn't have time to edit it before. Good thing they didn't try to do it today because it would be us. <coughs> yes, this clearly was before today. Before. <coughs> Where's the person flying the drone? in an undisclosed location. The camera quality is what just blows me away. You know how detailed and how clear it is. I don't ever think I've seen a crane inside a building. I'm a little concerned about how that's coming out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing another crane to get the crane out. So I think you can see at Greenville Park just the tremendous amount of work that has just taken place in this fairly short. It, there was a lot of effort to get to this point, obviously, um, but some really positive things. Bruce, are there, there's flyovers of Bridgewater and Sibley too. Is that, why don't you go ahead and move to that next one? I think that we've seen the angle of that several times. Are everybody okay with that? I'm not I'm sure, sure how long they are, so. Yeah, this one is. Yeah, I think we can go ahead and cut it now, Bruce. Everybody comfortable with that? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So and show us. to where? Let's do the Sibley one next. Let's see how long that's a minute 48 so we can. So I heard today um, that the Sibley project is slightly ahead of schedule right now, which is awesome to hear. They were able to pour more, the concrete footings were poured last week on Thursday and Friday, of course, we'd already sent the construction update out, but really some great progress. 
I just marvel at how they're able to work around the snow. Because yeah. if you watch the time lapse camera, Sibley had so much snow on that. Yes. Stage. And the one thing that's interesting about Sibley, you'll see there's some there's some sand that when they were doing the excavation. So for example, if you look on the on in, right near the building on the right hand side there, there's the snow. And then right to the right of that, there's something that looks like snow if there hadn't been snow on the ground. That's actually sand that was pulled out um, during the excavation process. So clearly at some point when a parking lot was redone, there was an additional layer of sand put down mm -hmm. to help with drainage and things like that. Is that enough for silly people to do that? Okay, let's go on to Bridgewater then. Yes. yes. <laughs> So doesn't that look like a drawing? Mm -hmm. It does. Except for the snow. Yes, except for the snow. But what I'm so... I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I think one thing we've all commented, it, it looks like it's the original mm -hmm. structure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, you're there now in that office. They've been in that office for a full week. Uh, there are still some you know, minor things that they're tweaking and, and working on. Um, and, you know, again, I've had a just to, to review the purpose of why we did this was to control entry into the building. I've had a, I have had a couple of comments from uh, people who I don't think quite understood that that was what we were trying to secure is that secure entrance. Because once we secure the entrance, we can't allow all of the parents in at the end of the day like they used to be. And so um, I really thank parents for their flexibility and patience and Principal Antoine has done a really masterful job of helping people understand what the new normal is. And so we certainly want to share with parents. It's not that we um, were looking to get them out, but we, as you know, we were really responding to a substantial amount of parent feedback about wanting to make sure that there was greater secure access at that facility because once people got in, they could basically be anywhere pretty quickly. So um, we've had a lot of positive feedback, as you said, like it's been there the whole time. So that's our construction. The flyover is worth several million words, right? So. Excellent. That's our construction update. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Enrollment report. Yeah, so you'll see the latest enrollment report uh, with the numbers for December. One thing I want to call your attention to is the second page of the document. For those of you who have been looking at this document for several years, this aligns with what Val was talking before about seeing a, a slight decrease in our elementary population. Mm -hmm. But what you'll notice is we have some pretty awesome class sizes. So. That's something we've been you know, watching for years, and as we've had ebbs and flows, uh, you'll notice that our class sizes are you know, really within a range where I think that we all would prefer them to be. Now, of course, that comes at the cost of having some less, uh, lesser number of elementary students rather than an increase in staffing. And in fact, you'll notice at Greenville Park, we do have two grade levels that are in three sections um, because, again, the numbers there did not support four sections. It's kind of decisions, again, as we talked earlier the kind of difficult decision that we make to uh, be good stewards of our dollars and to make sure that we can sustain our funding for as long as possible. So uh, if we show you this every month. I'll call attention to that specifically this month. Any other questions on the enrollment report? Okay, thank you. Um, late start update. Yes, just want to give a very brief update that you know one week from tonight we will have a two hour work session starting at 5 p.m. I just want to uh, provide you uh, updates that, as you know, we've continued to gather feedback on the concept plan that we've shared uh, in terms of the start times and end times. Uh, we had, uh, as you know, two parent sessions that uh, we had 140 people attend between the two. We just closed uh, a parent feedback opportunity for those people who could not attend. Of course, if you attended, you could still fill out the form. There was no way for us to say, oh, you came and can't fill, you know, fill it out. So we wanted as much feedback. I closed that survey last night. Uh, 298 additional responses that we will uh, be providing for you next week. Uh, we added, a, just uh, last night, we sent out an additional staff survey while we had face-to-face -face meetings, or will at the end of this week, we'll have had 
face-to-face -face feedback meetings in every single building. We wanted to provide another opportunity for staff to provide feedback again on the same four questions. And so uh, that is happening right now. As of this morning, there are already 40 additional responses there. And then working with the District Youth Council, as you remember, they held a mm -hmm. session where they had about 30 students come. There was some question, could we provide an opportunity for students to provide additional feedback? Uh, you saw three of our DYC folks here, uh, Jack Rizzo, Alice Zhang, and uh, Kaya Schomburg, who are all integral in the, um, the mental health, uh, well, the, there's the two co-chairs, and then um, Kaya chairs the, the Student Mental Health Committee. They've reviewed the survey that we're going to send out tomorrow. Again, a replication of what we had asked students in the meeting that they attended. Um, they do have one additional question. We did ask students at that meeting to say, well, there's a pathway to potentially having both a later school start time and flex, if you had to choose, what would you choose? Because we think that's a question we asked in person, we wanna ask that question as well. Um, so we're preparing those things, as we said, uh, activities director Joel Olson will be here to act, to discuss uh, numerous challenges that you know we have known about for some time, but continue to arise around how would athletics play into a later school start. Uh, we also will have Benjamin Buss here to talk about what are, are the transportation concerns? They are, I think, pretty serious transportation concerns. So we are working to provide, get that information ready for you and we look forward to a robust discussion. I do have news hot off the press that just this evening, Farmington Public School has voted to move to a later school start time beginning next year. Now their process was a couple of months ahead of ours. They had started theirs um, really in June where they, they were starting what we had started in the fall in June and so, uh, they did vote to go that way. So again, we're seeing some other school districts around us um, who have been uh, who have voted to go uh, with this. Now again, as we know, when we go to the north, one of the main differences is that the population density of those school districts, they're far more uh, dense in terms of population than we are. So that's a hard thing, I think, for sometimes people when we're talking about the transportation. Well, they've done it in YZ or they've done it in Edina, now they're doing it in Farmington. That's where just our transportation piece is just a little bit different. but. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to put these things together and we look forward to a robust conversation next Monday. Do you know what time you can move it to? I do not. I don't have that in front of me. Well, I would think it'll come through in our endless meetings yeah. in a day or so. Okay. Er, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Any other questions or any questions on late start update? Yeah, the purpose tonight was just to give you an update sure. on where yeah, no, we're at with great. some of those things to prepare for that yeah, conversation. It's going to be an excellent work session. Um, so just a reminder, the MSBA board, me rec board member recognition luncheon where we're going to honor board member Noel Stratman's 40 years of service on the board. Um, so um, I know thank you to uh, board members who RSVP their attendance. We'll have a nice representation of the board. So we're um, and Dr. Hillman as well. So it would be a, a great day to celebrate and all service to the district. Um, just as a heads up, uh, we're looking at meeting a special school board meeting again as we work through the bond projects and the timing of the award bids, which we know is really critical in terms of keeping um, the projects on schedule. Um, around also and working that around um, board meetings. So um, in March, we typically only have one board meeting um, because of spring break. So um, we are looking at needing a special school board meeting on Monday, March 30th, 2020 at 5 p.m. And we're just um, teeing that up for you now. Again, we, we do only need quorum for something like that, but we have been fortunate when we've had those special School board meetings, everyone has freed their schedule in order to approve those bids. Um, these bids would be for the Longfellow renovations, so moving right along. Um, future meetings then, as we mentioned, Monday, December 16th, which is a week from today at 5 p.m., we will do the board work session around the late start um, for secondary students. Um, um, and at five, again, 5 p.m. in the Northfield High School Media Center. Uh, Board meetings then in January, we're already looking at the 2020 calendar year. Um, January, Monday, January 13th will be our first meeting of the new year. Um, organizational board meeting will um, begin followed by the regular school board meeting. And then Monday, January 27th, um, both of those meetings at 7 p.m. in the Northfield High School Media Center. So with that, I ask for a motion to adjourn and that is moved by Noel. Is there a second? Second by Jeff. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye.
Thank you. I oppose the motion. Carries. We are adjourned. Thank you. 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 Thank you.